Where my, the amateurish suggestions in your recent tweets suggest to me that it is high time I inform you on the painful subject of prayer. You might have spared the comment that my advice about his prayers for his mother proved singularly unfortunate. That is not the sort of thing that a nephew should be tweeting about his uncle, nor a junior tempter about the undersecretary of a department. It shows a desire to shift blame. You must learn to pay for your own blunders. When possible, it is best to keep the patient from praying seriously altogether. When the patient is an adult recently reconverted to the enemy's party, like your man, this is best done by reminding him, or making him think he remembers, the parrot-like nature of his prayers in childhood. In reaction against that, he may be persuaded to try something more inward, spontaneous, informal, and unregularized, and what that will actually produce in a beginner is an attempt to create in himself a sort of devotional mood with no actual attachment to his intelligence or will. One of their poets, Coleridge, recorded that he did not pray with moving lips and bended knees, but composed his spirit to love and a sense of supplication. That is the sort of prayer we want. And since it bears a superficial resemblance to the prayer of silence practiced by those very advanced in the enemy's service, many lazy and clever patients can be taken in by it for quite some time. At the very least, they might be persuaded that their bodily position makes no difference to their prayers, for they always forget what you must always remember, that they are animals and whatever their bodies do affects their souls. It is funny how mortals always picture us putting things into their minds. Our best work is done by keeping things out. If this fails, then you must rely on a subtler misdirection of the patient's intentions. Whenever they are focused on the enemy himself, we are defeated. But there are ways of preventing them from doing so. One of the simplest is to have them move their focus from him to themselves. Have them focus on their own minds and try and produce by an action of their own wills feelings there. When they meant to ask him for loving kindness, let them try and produce charitable feelings in themselves and not notice that this is what they are doing. When they are praying for courage, let them be trying to feel brave. And when they are praying for forgiveness, let them be trying to feel forgiven. Let them measure the success of their prayers by their success in producing these feelings in themselves. And never let them remember that their success and failure in producing these feelings is largely related to whether they felt well or ill or whether they were awake or sleepy. But of course, the enemy will not be idle. Whenever there is prayer, there is danger of his immediate action. He is cynically indifferent to the dignity of his position and ours as pure spirits, and to human animals on their knees he pours out self-knowledge in a shameless fashion. Even if he defeats your first attempt at misdirection, we have an even subtler weapon. The humans do not start from that direct experience of him which we can unhappily not avoid. They have never seen that ghastly luminosity, that stabbing, searing glare which forms the background of permanent pain to our lives. If you look into your patient's mind while he is praying, you will not find that. If you examine the object on which he is focused, you will find it is a composite of many quite ridiculous ingredients. There will be some images derived from pictures of the enemy as he appeared during that discreditable episode known as the Incarnation. There will be others, vaguer and perhaps even savage, associated with the other two persons. Some of his own reverence and the bodily sensations that accompany it will be objectified and attributed to the object itself. I have known cases where what the patient called their god was in the left corner of their bedroom ceiling, or in their own head, or in a crucifix on the wall. But whatever the composite object, you must keep them praying to it, to the object they have made, and never to the person who made them. You might even convince your patient to attach great importance to the correction and improvement of this composite object. Keep it in his imagination constantly during his prayers. For if he ever finds the distinction, if he ever stops praying to the imagined God and really begins praying to the being who made him, then our situation is, for the moment, quite desperate. If your man ever casts these images aside, or keeps them with a full knowledge of their subjective nature, if he gives himself to the completely real, external, invisible presence there in the room with him, and never being known by him as he is known by it, that is when the incalculable may occur. In avoiding this situation, the real nakedness of the soul in prayer, you will be aided by the fact that the humans don't really want it nearly as much as they suppose. There is such a thing as getting more than they bargained for.